Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, actually. Um, I'm Mary. I'm one of the librarians here at Mentor Public Library, and I want to welcome Shara and um, Linda, who are here from Kemper House, who are going to talk to us about the ABCs of dementia. You know, so I want to say welcome to you all, and we will um, get started right now. Thank you guys all for allowing us this opportunity. I'm so glad we can still get together during this difficult time and whoever thought this would be happening but um we hope that the information we're going to share with you will be helpful especially if you're in the process of taking care of someone with dementia we're going to go over more of the challenging behaviors that can happen when your loved one has dementia um linda and i have worked together for oh my gosh almost 20 years (laughs) have lots of personal stories at kemper house working with folks with dementia. So for those of you who don't know, Kemper House is a residential Alzheimer's and dementia care community. Um, We're assisted living facility and we're in Highland Heights. We used to have a mentor location, we do not anymore. We have Strongsville. Highland Heights is a very new building, about five and a half, six years old. And then we also have a Worthington location that is down by the Columbus area. We work with folks from all stages of cognitive impairment. We even have our Kemper Cognitive Wellness Division now that we are helping people even in their 20s, 30s, and 40s who are have, have a family history of Alzheimer's and dementia. They may not be eating right or something's going on with them that they're experiencing some, some brain fog and they're concerned or other health issues that are contributing to some cognitive impairments. So we have Dr. Nate Bergman and our whole wellness team that's working with folks all the way from before you're ever diagnosed or hopefully you won't be kind of preventing that from happening. And then Kemper House is for folks who have been diagnosed, you know, families are struggling and we can do everything from like daycare where they just spend the day with us, short-term respite and living with us. So Um, That's where Linda and I's background is. Linda was nursing director for years. I was an administrator and also do like community relations. So we have a lot of personal stories that we kind of add to our talk that may be helpful because a lot of times families will say, oh my gosh, I just went through that last week or oh my gosh, I can totally relate to that. Um, So the way that we conduct our talks is very open format. So please feel free to interject, share your experiences ask questions throughout the talk. We learned from you guys too over the years. We've really gotten some interesting information over the years. Linda, did you wanna add anything before I go to the slideshow or? No, I think you're covering that very well. And we have all stages as uh, Shara said of Alzheimer's disease and we can care for people. There's no reason why they have to to leave uh, Kemper House. end stage of life care um, and it's very family oriented so it's very personal not only to the family that owns Kemper House but for um, employees like uh, Cher and I. And also Linda and I both have been through this personally with family members so we kind of have been on both sides of the fence and can understand kind of like our calling to work with folks and try to help them, families and residents. So I'm going to go to screen share so you can see our slideshow and what we're talking about, but we often (laughs) kind of go off on little tangents and tell stories. And so, you know, it's good information and especially some of the pictures that we have in here about the brain and the shrinkage. Um, So we want to share the slideshow, but don't be upset with us. (laughs) We go on to our little stories. People with dementia behave the way they do because they have a terrible disease. And um, this behavior is not for um, attention seeking or because they're bad people. Uh, It's because of the disease. You wanna move the slides on? Yeah. What exactly is dementia? Oh, these are the goals that we're going to do. You want to go to the next um, slide? Yeah. 
uh, dementia, people, that first thing they ask me is what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? And dementia is a symptom. A physician will use it as a diagnosis until they figure out exactly what is causing this dementia. And there's over a hundred diseases that we know of that can cause dementia. Alzheimer's disease is the cause of 80% of dementias. So the physician is probably pretty accurate if he gives them the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. But um, we have a condition that's called um, Lewy body disease. And uh, that's characterized by very vivid hallucinations. We had a lady that um, would come to our lectures and she was telling us about her mom who has Lewy body disease. Mm -hmm. She enjoys sitting in the front living room, uh, looking out the window and watching the family of gorillas play in the yard in the tree. And of course, there's nothing out there, but um, because of the disease, uh, she sees real families. Uh, vascular dementia is caused by strokes or um, many strokes, TIAs. There's others like traumatic brain injury. We have, what, three retired pro football players living with us in our facilities that have dementia as a result of uh, brain injuries. And uh, the physician didn't said that it wasn't the a result of that Sunday afternoon when they had to be carried off the field. It was just the constant abuse through the years of playing football that causes it. So there, those are just a few of the many. Um, we had a gentleman, his wife um, worked, works as a um, newscast person here in Cleveland and he fell off a scaffold at work. And after he came to from a coma, he no longer recognized his family. So we're going to talk about the different uh, signs and symptoms of dementia. This is the picture of a, a healthy brain. You can see that on the left. And then at, at an autopsy shows the results of the uh, brain from severe Alzheimer's disease or any type of dementia because uh, dementia really is, uh, causes uh, deterioration and death to brain cells. So there actually is a shrinkage. Now, the difference between dementia and say someone who had a stroke and, and no longer can walk, if there's brain cells left, they can go to therapy and um, be retaught how to walk or do certain uh, tasks. And that's because there's still brain cells there. So if part of your brain, the cells connect with other parts of the brain cells and they no longer exist, if you still have other brain cells, then that therapy can train your brain to uh, do that chore again. Uh, you and I and everyone healthy, we should be training our bra brain every day. So we use the cells in our brain. The one way we can do that is like for lunch, eat lunch with the opposite hand. If you're right-handed, eat your lunch with your left hand or brush your teeth with the opposite hand. So if you're right-handed and you usually brush your teeth with your right hand, use your left hand. This is a way we can teach our brain and, and use the brain function capacity at its highest. So there are warning signs of dementia. Now, at first, it appears like your normal everyday forgetfulness. And often um, these symptoms progress and get worse, but families can be in denial. But they do present in the early stages of um, an inability to plan or solve problems. Uh, a lady was telling me that she knew her husband had something terribly wrong because he's a, a CPA and uh, they went out to dinner one evening and he couldn't figure out the tip, the 15% tip. Now that wouldn't be an indicator for me because I can't do that now. For someone that's uh, proficient in mathematics, that would be a sign. And I always ask um, people, families, when um, I go to assess someone, what was that 
incident or that event that said that something is very, very wrong. They get confused with time and place. People with true dementia, um, time to them has no continuity. It's not sequential. They can be maybe 50 years old now and 21 or 22 years old in an hour or so. Or especially if they sundown, you'll see this behavior. They may be uh, pretty um, adapted during the day, but when the sun starts going down, they get much more confused. And I've actually had a lady who was in her 80s come to me and she cried that she missed her mommy and she wanted to go home to her mommy. So in her mind, she probably was seven or eight years old. And we've had ladies uh, in their 80s that had to get home to the baby or they hear the baby crying. And of course, we don't tell them your baby uh, is all grown up or you don't have any babies. So, um, and depending on the stage of the disease, uh, baby dolls can work because inanimate objects become real. And here's a whole list of the, the 10 warning signs of ADL, uh, of um, Alzheimer's disease. Please note what I underlined. This is the one that makes the difference between are these other things that are happening just everyday forgetfulness or are they really dementia? It has to be a loss of mental function severe enough to interfere with the daily life and then you're going to see some uh, mood and personality changes, uh, of, course, of course, the decrease in uh, poor judgment. Uh, and they tend to withdraw um, and they start to uh, have trouble identifying family uh, and familiar objects. Mm -hmm. You wanna add anything there, Sarah? Um I, when you talk about when they don't know how old they are, I always think back, we had a lady years ago when we had our mentor building who came to us and said, I'm not going in my room. She goes, there is an old lady in my bathroom. And she would not go in her room. She was very scared that the stranger was in her bathroom. So we just thought she was, I don't know. It took us a little bit to figure it out that it was herself in the mirror and she wouldn't go in the bathroom because she saw this little old lady who's probably 75, 80. I mean, probably, she was probably in her 80s and did not want to go in there. Be and then we asked her how old she was. And she said she was 22. Yeah. And I just, I was like, wow, because this was someone who could converse with you. You know, you didn't, I guess, you know, sometimes they seem to be kind of on the money in conversations and you don't realize how much more progressed maybe they are yeah. until you ask some questions like that. Right. So right. we had to, eventually we, we just covered up her mirror and she couldn't see her reflection anymore. And then it wasn't a problem. She would go yeah. in, but yeah, was, she no longer recognized herself, yeah, yeah. which um, it's just amazing to me that uh, this disease can be that terrible. We're gonna talk a little bit about the three stages of dementia, mild, moderate, and severe, only because it's important to know where your loved one or this person that you're caring for, where are they in the stages of the dementia? Because what might work in one stage wouldn't work in another. Like in the severe stage, when they no longer recognize themselves or they think they hear a baby crying, this inanimate doll baby actually becomes real to them. That wouldn't work in stage one. So it's important that if you're caring for someone with dementia, that you learn the different stages and, and where they are in that disease. Uh, in the mild stage, there again, it does sometimes uh, present itself as uh, someone that's just forgetful. Um, I think the, Difficulty driving is a very significant one. And I hear this quite often that that was the first thing that someone realized that their loved one had something wrong. It wasn't just forgetfulness. 
we've we've had at least three people just off the top of my head that moved to us because the family really realized that because of the driving like um the three that were the worst were like they got lost for hours and hours <clears throat> they had to get the police involved um two of them were found in pennsylvania they just mm -hmm. got on the freeway went the wrong way i mean that was really like the the situation that yeah um, opened the family's eyes the one lady was telling me her husband left to go to the dentist and about a half an hour later the dentist office called and wanted to know where jim was and she said well he should have been there at least 15 minutes ago and then she was started to worry she didn't know whether she should call the police or get in the car and go look for him and then she heard a car door slam in the driveway and she went out and it was jim and he said i forgot where i was going I'm not sure if he had remembered where he was going, if he would have remembered how to get there. And that's called cognitive mapping. And hopefully you can sit there and picture in your mind, getting in your car and driving to work from your home or driving to someplace familiar like church or the grocery store. Uh, people with dementia lose that ability. So, um, and of course, if it had been forgetfulness, and eventually it would have come to him where he was going. Oh, I knew I, I was going to the dentist. But if it doesn't come to you, then that's dementia. There have been a lot of uh, situations where it had to involve driving. With my uh, father-in-law, he got in the car and, then, and he and my mother-in-law were on the way to church. And when they came to a stop sign, you had to turn left or right. And he said to her, which way do I turn to go to church? And this is some place where he, they have been going to this church for like 30, 40 years. So she knew something um, was very wrong. And they, of course, lose their way. Uh, difficulty following recipes. With the Thanksgiving coming up and the Christmas holiday reminds me of... Um, a lady that was telling me that her mother on the holidays, mom always made the gravy. And this particular holiday, she, uh, the daughter said, mom, you can go in and make the gravy now because I'll finish setting the table and then we can eat. So mom went into the kitchen and then when the daughter came in, mom was sitting there at the table crying. And the daughter said, what's wrong, mom? And mom said, I forgot how to make the gravy. So um, these are just some things that um, you're going to notice and um, will trigger what you think was maybe forgetfulness. Now you know that it truly is dementia. We're going to talk about some of the behaviors, but another one involves the misplacing things. And then, um, like I said, the, the gentleman who was a CPA couldn't figure out 15% for a tip. And people can't manage their checkbooks anymore. Yeah, I've heard that a lot from families that mom and dad were always so good with their money and everything. And they were at the house checking the mail or, or they were there and bill collectors were calling and late notices were coming. So we had a lot of families who that was one of the first warning signs that was something was going on. Yeah. Or they spend their money very unwisely. I know this lady that she was a widow and you get all these, uh, all this junk mail, people wanting um, donations for this and that. And uh, this lady was telling me her mother donated to everybody. She was writing checks right and left. So um, let's go to stage two. Okay, this is where they're disoriented to time and place. One minute they can be in this world and the next minute they'll be in another world. They no longer recognize family and friends. I, that's um, amazing and very sad to me. Um, I had a gentleman that came to one of my support groups um, one time, and he said, I'm here because I, I think I have Alzheimer's disease. And I said, what makes you think that? He said, well, the other night I was trying to think of the name of that actress that said, come up and see me sometime. 
and that was Mae West, I think. And I said, hmm, are you married? And he said, yes. I said, do you know your wife's name? He said, well, of course I do. And I said, what is it? And he told me. I said, do you have children? He said, yes. I said, what are their names? And I, he told me. I said, well, then you don't have dementia. I said, um, it's when you don't recognize or you don't remember their names of uh, familiar people or even family. Uh, it's not some movie star that you probably haven't seen on TV or in the movies for years. And a big one that we see, and most of our residents come to us, I think, in stage two, wouldn't you say, Shara? I would probably say, yeah. Stage one, they can usually stay at home as long as there's 24-hour uh, care. But by stage two, and then families will come and visit, the, the uh, resident will say, you never come to see me. You don't love me. And then the daughter or the son will say, why well, come every day, mom? Don't you remember? No, she doesn't remember. So rather than arguing with them or trying to convince them that yes, you come every day, say something like, I'm gonna start coming more often and I do love you and I'm going to show you that I, that I love you very much. And then that's validating where they're at because uh, they can't get into your world anymore. You have to get into their world. So validate, you know, what they're believing, where they are in their world, and then redirect. Um, when you go to visit, or even while they're, they're still at home, look at photo albums or old uh, Christmas cards or anything where you can reminisce, because I think they do love to reminisce. I wish. Um, my grandmother had dementia, and to this day, a lot of her recipes, we can't make them the way she made them. So I wish we would have talked to her about what she did because she probably yeah. still could have remembered um, that for quite some time because she cooked a lot and, you know, just things like that. Old photographs. Um, my mother-in-law has dementia now. She can still tell you who's in all the old photographs. Oh. You know, it's amazing that long-term memory a lot of times is still yeah. pretty good. I know. But, we have pictures of... Uh, like my great grandparents in that generation. And a lot of people in there, I don't know who they are. So when my grandparents were living, I wish I would have written on the back of the the picture who these people were. Yeah. Never know now. So socially inappropriate is another one. And I know the Alzheimer's Association has these little business cards that you can take if you're at a restaurant, you can like slip it to the server and it says my loved one has Alzheimer's disease, you know, just to make it a little bit more easy, you know, not easy, but like to make people understand, maybe there'll be a little bit more things like that. Socially inappropriate. They just kind of lose their filters. They don't have filters like you and I about no, not no. saying something that might be hurtful or things like that. Yeah. Um, forget how to use familiar objects. That always brings me to silverware that's probably one of the most common we'll see where they don't know how to use the fork or the spoon and they want to just pick up their food with their fingers sometimes we can cue them get them started with the fork or spoon and once you start the process then they'll finish um, we try to let them be as independent as they can for as long as possible i had a lady that told me um when I asked her, what was the event that told you something was very wrong? She says, my husband told me. He said, she said, he came down the stairs one morning for breakfast and he said, I have to call the doctor. He said, uh, I have Alzheimer's disease. And uh, she said, what makes you think that? He says, well, I know I'm supposed to shave, but I can't remember how. Stage three, this is the end stage. Um, they're totally dependent. We always encourage the families to get hospice involved when they start seeing these signs. And hospice is a wonderful, wonderful uh, organization. So um, they not only help the person who has the disease, but they are a huge help to the family. Mm -hmm. Um, and people aren't in these, you know, 
perfect little boxes. I mean, they can show symptoms of stage two and stage three, or um, one day they might appear to be a stage three and they're really a stage two, but um, it's important that you know it's a progressive disease. And right now, unfortunately, there's no cure. So um, eventually uh, they will go through the stages to the um, end stage of life. Yeah. We've had residents who hadn't communicated with words in quite some time. And they're having a really good day and they're talking one day. And we've actually called the family and said, you might want to come and visit today. It was like unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so we've seen, you know, things just, it's like, I know Dr. Baum always told me, it's like cars have spark plugs. Sometimes they're firing right. And sometimes you need a tune up or, you know, it's, they're just, it varies. Yeah. A lot of times we find visits with if families can visit in the morning, a lot of times they do a little bit better because as the day goes on, they get, their brain gets a little tired. But go to the yeah. next slide. We'll talk about sundowning a little bit. So what we just talked about are the things that are happening uh, to people with uh, dementia. Now they don't all experience all of these because it depends on where in the brain the destruction and uh, deterioration of the brain, brain cells are occurring. But these are the four things that could possibly happen. And um, I've seen folks with all of these, the amnesia that we talked about, they just don't remember anymore. It's not like forgetful, why did I walk into this room? I forget what I walked into this room for, but eventually it comes to you or you forget somebody's name. And eventually after you think about it, even like the next day, it, you, the name will come to you, but it's not someone that you uh, are familiar with, um, like a family member or a dear friend. Aphasia, and there again, there's two types of aphasia, the expressive aphasia. I just can't find the right words and they'll make up words or they'll, use a, the wrong word to identify an object. And receptive, that's when they don't understand what you're trying to tell them. And it's very frustrating, not only for them, but for you. There's a couple of things that we can suggest is that you keep your sentences short, keep things simple. If you use a long sentence like eight or 10 words, they're only going to grasp maybe one or two of those words. So you wanna keep your sentences short. If they get to the point where they have the aphasia, especially the receptive, you might wanna like, it's time to eat and go through the motions of eating, or it's time to brush your teeth. We also have a 10 second rule. And that is that when you ask them something like, how are you? you need to give them 10 seconds to respond. And quite often they can come up with the right answer. I'm fine or I don't feel well. Um, 10 seconds is a lot, long time, but they really do need that time to process the information, take it in, what did she say? And then transfer it to the other side of the brain and figure out how am I gonna respond? So that's important that you use short sentences, you keep things simple, and you give them the time that they need. Uh, apraxia, that's the inability to, to do pre-programmed tasks like feeding themselves or uh, shaving, driving a car. It's interesting, when I was learning to drive a car in the early 60s, late 50s, the um, windshield wiper was on or off. Now they got different speeds. And then uh, I think if I remember correctly, to do wash the windshields, there was a little button on the dash bag, dashboard, now it's, and then the um, turn signal does all kinds of things. So you can imagine how difficult it is for an elderly person with dementia to get in a car and try to figure out, you know, uh, the dashboard alone would be uh, overwhelming because it looks like the inside of a spaceship. 
Um, so these are things, that's why it's so important that if there's any signs of dementia and you have any concerns, certainly you wanna get this, these folks tested uh, to see if they are really able to uh, drive safely. And I know most of the hospitals today have in the occupational therapy department, they do testing for driving. And I know Euclid Hospital does. Who else do you know, Shara? I think Lake Hospital too. But yeah, Medicare pays for that too. I think one of them is simulated and one of them's live. And then we also have that friend who has a company. Um, oh yeah, Matt Gerwell. Keeping us safe. Where they do live, they'll go in the car with them. Or the simulated one, you know, sometimes, I don't know. You have to think of the doctor. So a lot of times we'll tell families like, tell your doc, call your doctor and talk to them when you're not there with your loved one and, and have them, you know, suggest or, or write a order to go get a driving assessment if that's what you're worried about. Cause then it's yeah. not you being the bad guy, it's the doctor. <laughs> Yeah, right. sometimes that works a little better. The, the VA does driving assessments as well. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Agnosia, that's when they no longer recognize familiar faces or familiar objects. Even at the, uh, the dinner table or breakfast, you know, you want to keep things simple. If you're having a bowl of cereal, there's no need to put out a knife, fork, and spoon. Just put the cereal and the spoon. As far as the knife goes, I mean, uh, if they're still able to cut their own food, that's okay. But uh, I've seen residents eating the, their peas and mashed potatoes with a knife. So we have to keep it simple and that helps them be successful. And a lot of folks, they like to do pre-programmed tasks. They remember how to like fold napkins or fold paper or hand towels or face towels. That's, that's a chore you can give them whether you need the help or not. Uh, we have a basket of uh, face towels and hand towels that we give the residents just for them so that they can do something, do a chore and be successful and feel useful. Okay, you wanna have anything to say, Shara? Well, just... Um going on to behaviors associated with okay. dementia. We've seen a lot of these on all levels, mood swings, verbally and physically aggressive. You know, going to verbally and physically aggressive, we've seen a lot where family members are arguing before they get to Kemper House. They'll be getting in fights, arguing. Don't you remember me? We've been married for, you know, 47 years or, or whatever. Just never argue with someone with dementia it's an there's no winning it's going to make your life so much more miserable and i can't even tell you how many times um someone's had to move to kemper house because of a aggressive physical outburst throwing something at their spouse 911 got involved because they were arguing or calling their loved one like stupid why don't you under why don't you don't know what that is or you know it's like don't even get to that point yeah you know, this is someone with brain damage who cannot reason with you you cannot make things worse it's going right. to make things worse for both of you um repetitive questions we've had so many folks who mm. said they just can't do it anymore because their loved one asks them 527 times a day you know I don't even know. It could be the simplest thing. Linda, I can't even think of an example right well, now. Well, a lady was, she and her son came to the support group to share this information. And that's why the support groups are so uh, wonderful is because uh, they can share information and, and maybe come up with a solution to a problem that you're having that uh, neither Sharon and I would be able to offer a solution like they did. But anyway, her husband probably, I don't know how many times a day would say is today Wednesday. And she was telling her son one evening, you know, this is driving me crazy. He must ask me a hundred times a day is today Wednesday. So the son came and spent the weekend and decided he wanted to figure out what was so important about Wednesday. And um, Wednesday was the day that he took out the garbage and he was still successful and this was something that uh, he enjoyed doing and felt useful. So he didn't want to miss that day. So he would ask 
many, many times every day is today, Wednesday. So the sun made a big sign that said, today is not Wednesday, or it will cover up not, and it said today is Wednesday. So he still asked her several times a day, but she could also refer him to the sign and say, well, why don't you go look at the sign that Joe made you uh, in the kitchen? Like Shara said, that this is one of the things that uh, families will say to me too, is the, the questions driving me crazy. We have a whole one hour presentation we do on repetitive questions. It's called, are we there yet? Yeah. Kind of referring to like the kids in the back of the car, you're going on vacation and they ask you, you know, a hundred times, are we there yet? Are we almost there? Um, so we have a whole talk we do just on repetitive questions that maybe yeah. we can, you know, do for you guys in the future if you're interested. The next thing's delusions and hallucinations. We recently had a lady move to Kemper House because she had been in the Holocaust, like her family um, had gone to a concentration camp when she was very little. And she started having delusions, hallucinations that her neighbor who lived next door to her was trying to gas her house. So the police had been involved many times, many calls to 911. Um, she was for the most part, still high functioning, able to take care of herself at home. But this paranoia of the neighbor trying to gas her to, was to the point that she had to, to move to Kemper House. Yeah. The family just did not know what to do. It's really sad because for her, it had some connections to what had happened to her family. So it was a really sad situation. Yeah. We had a lady that at night, she would have um, hallucinations that she'd hear a little girl crying outside. And in the middle of the night, she'd get up and she was living with her son and go to his bedroom and wake him up and say, you know, that the little girl outside is crying, please go out and help her. And I went to the house to assess her and he was telling me, he says, neither one of us are getting any sleep. And this is probably one of the indicators when people say to me, how do you know when it's time to um, bring a loved one to a nursing facility like Kemper House? And I'm, I'm, I'm saying if it's harming you or it's a harm to them, mm -hmm. it's physically or emotionally um, detrimental to you. And certainly if you're not getting your sleep, um, so this is one of the indicators. And uh, when I was assessing her then, she said, did my son tell you that I hallucinate at night? I found this very interesting because usually they don't remember that they were hallucinating, but rather I would have expected her to say, you know that there's a little girl outside that cries at night. And, uh, but she said to me, I hallucinate at night. Now I can sit here at two o'clock in the afternoon and tell you that there's no little girl out there, but it's very real to me at two in the morning. So I was fascinated by that because they don't usually realize that they're hallucinated. Um, and we've heard a lot of really interesting stories because we do first responder training for the police and fire departments. So over the years, we've heard some really interesting stories and really interesting how the brain works with this disease. Yeah. The paranoia is also one of the reasons that uh, 911 is called. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the paranoid behavior involves um, believing that someone's trying to hurt you, someone's stealing your money, uh, my spouse is having an affair. We had a gentleman, his wife came to live with us because he um, had quite a bit of money, was able to care pay for someone to come in and take care of her 24 hours a day. But um, every female caregiver that he brought in from the agency, his wife accused him of having an affair with her. And uh, she would be very mean to the caregiver and uh, try to actually harm them. So he had no choice because they were both in the 80s. He didn't have the energy or the stamina to uh, care for her. And she did tend to wander and exit seek um, 
and she, he said, and she's fast. You can walk really fast. And he said, I can't. Unfortunately, the disease uh, was a reason why she had to uh, eventually come to Kemper House. I'll try to, I, I, we still have quite a few slides and I'm just looking at the time. I'll try to go a little quicker. So real quick, hoarding, rummaging and hiding things. I know Lynn, um, we have seen a lot of this. Interestingly, with Alzheimer's and dementia, the hoarding isn't like, you know, the hoarding a TV show. It's usually they hide the things is what we've always seen. Yeah. When you have Alzheimer's and dementia, it's hidden. Like we had a 75 pulse shakes missing out of our refrigerator the one time, remember Linda? And we couldn't <laughs> yeah. figure out why are we going through so many health shakes? We found all of them in one of our residents' dressers. And of course we had to throw them all out because they had to be refrigerated, but uh, we had a lady who would take all the silverware and dishes from the kitchen and put them in her room. Yeah. And um, just a lot of yeah. hoarding we've seen over the years. Let me get on to the next one. We are planning well, on touched. having a hoarding program also run by Kemper House on December 14th. Um, so again, if that's something that you're interested in, please sign up for the program on December 14th, okay. specifically on hoarding for with dementia. Right. Well, we talked a little bit about the mood swings, but uh, they make mountains out of molehill. Little things that normally wouldn't have bothered them or it doesn't bother you, it becomes a catastrophic event and uh, they don't have the coping mechanisms that we have. So there again, it's important to keep things simple. And I wanted to stress this because the holidays are coming. Anything out of the routine is extremely stressful for them. So if uh, you go away for the holidays or if you have family over, it's important to keep things as simple as possible, keep things, uh, not no big crowds. Um, you want to prepare the person, maybe uh, your cousin is coming for the holidays and she hasn't seen you or your husband or your wife, your spouse for a whole year and they've changed quite a bit. You want to prepare uh, those people coming to your home too. We have, a, I have a whole list um, that I could email you if, if you want of, of what to do to make the holidays a little bit easier for you and your loved ones. And just remember that all their reactions to situations are brought on by a feeling of fear, frustration, uh, losing control. These are very negative feelings and it's up to us as the caregiver to try, try to reduce these negative feelings and make life as comfortable and pleasant as possible. Verbal and physical aggression, we always ask, like a lot of times we would get a resident who was kicked out of a nursing home or another assisted living. And Linda taught me this years ago, we would always, I always wanted to know, well, what happened right before that big event that sent them out 911 or had, you know, the police called or whatever the situation was. Nine times out of 10, we find that it was the caregiver who did something wrong to escalate the situation. We're real big at Kemper House on like picking up on little clues that we need to, you know, calm the person down or get them to a quiet area because maybe there's signs that they're starting to get worked up. And we are real good at like preventing these situations from occurring. But you gotta look at the five, the who, what, where, why, when of what happened right before that outburst because right. I can't tell you how many times we ended up accepting someone for admission even though other places didn't want them and we were very successful with them yeah because um, we're just very aware um you know the things that really can get them riled up and it can yeah. be different for a lot of people like getting overstimulated when you talk about the holidays some people can't handle we can't even have them go to like live entertainment because that loud, busy, lots of people around can get them worked up just that yeah. alone. Um, so just be very, you look for the early warning signs like arguing, pacing, raising hands, throwing things, and maybe the voice is getting louder. Know when the situation around them, you have to remove them from that or remove you know, the noise or, or what's bothering them. Sometimes yeah. it's easier to keep them where they are and remove what's bothering them. 
And when they say no, it means no. Okay. And that this is an early warning sign that this is going to escalate to perhaps even harming you. So yeah. keep that in mind. Um, I always wanted to know why they remembered the question and not the answer. <laughs> I, I do know from research that um, they're not looking for a yes or no answer. It's just like the children in the back seat of the car. Are we there yet? They're looking for reassurance. I'm not going to have to sit here in this back seat for the rest of my life <laughs> with my siblings. And uh, in my case, uh, I had four or three siblings and my father smoked Lucky Strikes. So I'm sitting in the back seat with three siblings <coughs> coughing from the, so there, we were looking for reassurance and that's what these folks are looking for. And what can cause the repetitive action is like the need of that man that took out the garbage to not miss this very important day. Um, they may ask for a loved one over and over again and um, there again, we have a whole hour presentation on repetitive behaviors. Uh, we never lie to the, we never uh, tell the, the resident uh, that their loved one passed away. And when Bertha was asking where Woody was, uh, we would say, well, he must be okay because we haven't heard anything. So, or he's probably on his way. And then we, we would redirect her and say, you know, dinner's going to be coming pretty soon. Why don't you help us, please, um, maybe fold the napkins or whatever. Well, one time, um, this other resident, she said, where's Woody? Where's my husband? The resident said, he's dead. Stop asking. Well, with that, she started sobbing and was absolutely inconsolable. And she said, don't you think I'd remember that he died? When did this happen? Did I go to the funeral? Who took me? It caused all kinds of anxiety. So we never tell them that their loved one's dead. Okay. We, we talked we a little bit a about whole, delusions. Go ahead. We actually have a whole hour talk now on hallucinations and delusions. Um, if you guys are interested, maybe we can, you know, add some of these other talks next yeah. year. We can skip that one, yeah. Yeah. Sundowning. Sundowning. Has anyone ever had an experience with sundowning? Well, there, no. it happens around three or four in the afternoon, and uh, you'll see increased confusion, agitation, other troubling behaviors. So you don't really know what causes it. There's some suggestion that uh, it's a disruption of the circadian rhythms. And we know if we don't get a good night's sleep and, and if we don't dream, that um, eventually we're going to get um, in a terrible mood and it's going to affect our health. Some people with dementia are known to not complete REM cycles and they have a lot of sleeping uh, problems. So uh, we have to do the best we can to manage the sundowning by putting them on a uh, consistent sleeping schedule, uh, limit the caffeine and food just before uh, meals, keep your rooms well lit, especially like now at five o'clock in the afternoon is dark out. That would encourage or promote uh, early sundowning too. And also we find when the, like now, as it gets, dark earlier and earlier it can start happening even earlier we oh yeah yeah so i'm gonna go on wandering and exit seeking we have had a lot of residents come to us because they wandered away from the home and they were missing for hours and luckily you know the police found them or whatever the situation in most cases you know they are found safely um but we've had residents who are you know trying to get out of the building it, it can be very scary yeah um, we had a lady one time in at Olmstead uh, they just opened the building she was one of our first residents and she opened the window in the uh, tv room and climbed out oh my gosh well see we also were uh, in the infant stage of caring for these residents this was probably 25 years ago and uh, so they put the stops on the windows that you can only open them like uh, a 
an inch or two. Yeah, yeah, that's how ours are at our building. They only open just for a little bit, right? But it's interesting, some of the reasons they come up with for where they say they're going. I mean, I had a guy tell me he was leaving for the ports of Cleveland. A lot of times they'll pack their suitcases or put all their stuff in a box or something and they're like ready to go. Oh yeah. Um, so that can be that that can be something that's really hard to redirect them because um, they have they're on a mission. So that's another reason a lot of times families can't handle things at home. Yeah. I'll go on to the next. Hoarding, rummaging, hiding. We had a family, I remember they were so upset because their mom would take all the clothes out of her dresser, fold them all, sort them, and she would spend hours and hours just going through her dresser, and it made them crazy. And, you know, we said, be glad that she's something that's actually like an activity. It's keeping her busy. And, you know, she would spend sometimes two, three hours doing that. And what yeah. could she potentially be doing that could be much more could be destructive, you know? Yeah. So honestly, that wasn't, in that situation, it wasn't a bad thing. But we talked a little bit about hoarding, but hiding things, you should see some of the things that our families have found when they're emptying out the house or, or downsizing. Um, we had one that found a Bible and like every third or fourth page was a, what, a $20 bill, Linda? Yeah. I mean, they you had to go through everything because there was money and valuables hidden yeah. everywhere. So you if, know, if you I, know your loved one is hoarding uh, or hiding things, especially they hide things because of the paranoid where they think people want to steal things from them. Mm -hmm. You have someone in your house that's uh, hiding things don't even don't even throw the garbage out until you go through it, because you just can't imagine where they would uh, think to hide. Someone um, uh, did an assessment recently, and uh, they were quite wealthy, and he she had a couple hundred thousand dollar ring that she lost, and uh, they were on vacation. But anyway, he finally found it. It was in her shoe. Yeah. We just had a resident whose dentures were missing and we found them. You know how a ceramic, um, when you make ceramics, they have like a hole in the bottom, you know, where they fire them. Yeah. Well, she had wrapped them in tissues and paper towels and it was way up inside of the ceramic rabbit or whatever it was. Luckily, we were able to find her dentures, but yeah, you know. Don't argue. Stay calm. That's easier said than done. And we tell our staff, just real quick, when you go on to the unit or the neighborhood where the residents are, it's like smile, like you are like on stage because they're going to feed off of you. If you're showing outwardly that you're frustrated and on your wits end, that's going to, yeah, they're going to change their behavior. So you have to, as hard as it is, it's like Disney World, you got to put on that um, happy face. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Leave all your problems uh, at home. Use short sentences, simple, easy, one step. Let them accomplish a task like uh, we're going to brush. I want you to brush your teeth. And first of all, it's like getting the toothpaste on the, the uh, toothbrush. They accomplish that step, then go to the next one. Show them how to brush their teeth one step at a time, apply the 10 second rule, make eye, eye contact. I tell the, the uh, police and fire department, you have a very short window to get their trust. And one of the ways to do that is uh, to make eye contact, call them by name, body language, uh, tone of voice, facial expression. These are 80% of communication. So even if you're angry, don't show it and never take anything that they do personally. Yeah, but I've, I've seen people take things very personally and you got to remember it's the disease. It's not your loved one. If they did not have the brain damage that they have, they would not be saying mean things to you. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So if oh, anyone's yeah. interested in like our support groups, we are doing a live one at Panera still, as long as we're able to. And then we also have a Zoom support group. We have a book club um, with the author. Um, she that wrote a book about caring for a mother with Alzheimer's. It's very interesting. Um, if you want to share your email address with me or get it to Mary, I would be happy to send you guys all out the invites. You know, if you chose to attend any of the events, we have a lot that we put on. Sometimes we just had Dr. Baum talk, um, some good information. Um, just share that with us. We do have another presentation scheduled on December hold on, I can't remember what it is. It's December 14th, um, which is a Monday at two o'clock. Um, and you would, it would sign up the same way as you signed up for this one. And it is um, geared toward hoarding on a dementia-based reasoning, I suppose is what I'm gonna say. So yes. hoarding, basically. Hoarding, okay, so we are saying hoarding. Um, and we have a repetitive question one and some other ones um, we can do down the road. But I hope this was helpful. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, again, if you want to contact me, it's Shira Inet at Kemper House, Highland Heights. That phone number is 440-461-0600. I would be happy, like I said, to share some of our educational programs. They're all free, open to the community. Um, I'd be happy to put you on our list to get that information as well. So thank you guys, and I hope you're managing during this difficult time. I know it can bring so many extra challenges, um, not being able to go too many places and being cooped up in the house, um, not even just for folks with dementia, for all of us. So hang in there and stay healthy. Thank you. You too.